the iron horse symbolized the very essence of America, opportunity, progress, and the spirit of westward expansion. It also represented unbridled capitalism and forever altered the way of life for America's indigenous people. I look back at it and I think it's amazing we survived it all sometimes. The railroads were the glamour industry of their day. They worked a paradigm shift, really, in the American economy, where we worked, how we worked. The train, of course, helped turn the American wilderness into civilization. It helped the rise of industry, corporations. They're a vital part of the industrialization of America, as well as the settlement of it. In an era in which four railroads already spanned the North American continent, James J. Hill took on the unthinkable task of building his own transcontinental railway. And he would do so largely without the aid of federal land grants. It is a huge undertaking. He launches these construction crews, thousands of men, animals, supplies, in a record-breaking race across the Great Plains. He was driven. I mean, you couldn't do these things unless you were driven. He was known as the Empire Builder and the Devil's Curse. Streets, towns, and counties were named in his honor, along with a persistent and invasive weed. He was mythologized in novels and was the subject of folk songs and Union battle cries. He had unlimited energy. He was as stubborn as the day is long. He had a temper. Every now and then he would fire somebody, and then the next day, why didn't you go to work today? Well, you fired me yesterday. That arrogance, supreme arrogance, is just fascinating. He would do more to transform the northern tier of the United States than any other individual. In the process, native tribes were displaced from their homelands to make way for immigrants and homesteaders. It's a matter of capitalism versus spiritualism. Wherever he pointed his line, new towns emerged and countless others prospered from the economic boon. And that's what Hill referred to. He said, some people build great monuments. This railroad is my monument. He was a catalyst for the agriculture, timber, and mining industries of the West and did more to open new markets in Asia than anyone of his generation. He was thinking globally. That's what makes him truly a transportation genius. Over time, he recognized the impact the railroads had on the nation's natural resources and became a leading advocate for the environment. At the helm of his empire, he weathered economic panics and staggering recessions, guiding the only transcontinental railroad to go unscathed by bankruptcy. He battled labor unions and industry titans, fought back hostile takeovers, and tested the limits of how big a corporation could be. Hill was not above using his power. He liked a good turf fight. It allows you to see capitalism in the raw. What is fair and what is unfair? How big can a company be before perhaps it poses a danger? Hill was a giant of his time in his vision, in his execution, and certainly in the public eye. He knew he wasn't just building a railroad. The railroad was the lifeblood to an empire. I think what he did could only be described in one word. Audacious. Audacious in boldness, in visionary thinking, in master planning. He not only changed trade, he changed the way the world worked. There absolutely was no equal. And good evening. I'm Jonathan Higgins of Train Aficionado, and I have two guests with me, Kyle and Steven. And they just released a wonderful documentary. Um, one of you guys want to tell us a little bit about that documentary? Sure. It's uh, the story of James J. Hill and the Great Northern Railway. And uh, pretty much follows his life story as he goes from a uh, poor farming kid to uh, becoming one of the most dominant figures in the railroad industry. Uh, by the time he retires. And um, so it's it's about him building the line and uh, the development of the country along the way. Wow. I mean, I, I've been watching it. It is phenomenal. 
I mean, I just, it's unbelievable the amount of detail, you know, going into his life. And, uh, you know, each each night I've been watching an episode and I keep learning more and more and more and, and things that I didn't know about the railroad, especially with the time zone thing kind of originated from the railroads. Um, question for both of you. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and how did you get into filmmaking? Do you want to go first? Kyle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, my name's Kyle and uh, I actually got into filmmaking. I was a skateboard kid and uh, I was sponsored and we made videos like that's like middle school getting uh, shooting and editing skateboard videos uh, kind of really got into it, you know, in high school and then after high school, moved to L.A., worked at uh, Universal Studios for a couple years and uh, kind of made my way back. And me and Steven uh, connected paths around 2006. And we've been kind of doing documentaries and uh, corporate communication, nonprofit stuff. And uh, ever since. Wow. How about yourself, Steven? Uh, my path uh, kind of goes through Los Angeles as well. Uh, I uh, was down there for about five years and. Uh, around the time uh, Ken Burns' documentary on the Civil War came out, and I was just enthralled by it, and I really hadn't considered documentary uh, as, as the genre or the field that I wanted to get into. Uh, but then I learned shortly thereafter that a, uh, a racetrack that uh, my family was involved with and I had worked for uh, pretty much uh, every summer uh, was closing, and I knew the story behind it. And so I came back to Seattle and... Uh, began to just dig in and figure out a way to create a documentary uh, about this story. And so it involved, you know, outreach and fundraising and all the research and the writing and, and none of this stuff I had any idea of how to do, but just kind of winged it. And uh, I actually, I actually wrote Ken Burns and said, I have no idea what a documentary script looks like. And uh, he sent me one for uh, his uh, piece on the Statue of Liberty, which was just super kind. So um, uh, that is kind of where it began with me. So the, the, the piece uh, was finished and uh, had some pretty decent success and uh, kind of went on from there to go to the next one. Wow. I mean, it's just amazing just looking at, you know, I mean, I produce short videos, but never mind the amount of work that this took, you know, getting the photos and writing the script and, you, you know, know, telling the story. <laughs> um, where did the idea come from to, to do this topic? So uh, shortly after I finished the, the documentary on the, the racetrack, uh, a woman who uh, worked for a historical society uh, managed to get a grant to do uh, a little documentary on uh, the Seattle Tacoma inner urban. And um, I sort of dug into it and uh, I came across a fellow named Warren wing, who was a avid collector. And uh, we ended up interviewing him for the piece. He's the only interview and uh, figured out a way to make a uh, 45 minute story. And, uh, it was uh, that gentleman that I asked what uh, what other train stories were interesting. And, and he mentioned the Great Northern. And so then I started poking around. And so this is like 96. And then about five years later, I kind of dug more into it and uh, wrote the first script in 2001 or so. Uh, and still knew very little about Hill or the railway. Um, and it kind of grew from there. Um, when you think about going from an hour long piece to a four hour piece uh, and knowing that you don't want to get too mired in the details, uh, you really have to have a story that is compelling, continually compelling. And uh, as we did more and more research, uh, it just got better and better and more interesting. And uh, so we started. So I started the project in like 2001 and tried to raise money several times over the years and didn't have much success. And then Kyle and I picked it up in 2017. And we had already shot eight, nine, 10 interviews, had written a couple of different scripts, sent out trailers, tried to get people's support. And, uh, but 2017, we kind of hit it 
full tilt and uh, uh, raised all the money and uh, and then did as you say, collected all the pictures, put it all together, all the voices, all the uh, uh, music and sound effects. Um, so yeah, so it took about five years once we restarted again to uh, get it off the ground. What was it like trying to be able to produce a documentary about a subject that you're you're not rail fans, right? Did not come from that background. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of the it, it's kind of the sorry, pardon the pun, but it's kind of the vehicle that allows us to tell this story. And uh, I mean, it's it's it, it, rail fan or not, it, it's such a transformative time in this country's history that it, it's just so compelling in how much it changed everything. Uh, I mean, I think only people today can relate to the internet as something that came into our existence in our lifetime and just really changed everything. Um, so, um, so it was sort of that era was really sort of uh, the, the thing that uh, compelled a lot of my interests. Yeah. I mean, I think certainly coming at it from uh, this individual, it, it was a, it, he touched so many kind of parts of American culture and different aspects. Um, you know, there was, he was an amazing railroader, but you know, the focus, the story is a lot more than just, you know, a railroad story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from the emergence of labor unions to the use of natural resources and treatment of Japanese laborers. I mean, you've heard a lot in the first transcontinental about Chinese labor. We didn't know anything about, you know, up until maybe a couple years ago about kind of the Japanese story and uh, the displacement of indigenous people and corporate power and trespassing. It's like it, it, to, to finish Stephen's metaphor about the vehicle, it just, it's such a, it's such a nice tool to, to uh, tell this kind of uh, really changing, changing period of American history. Wow. I mean, the thing was, is, you know, you've got, you know, four hours you know, in the series, you were able to find a lot of people to be able to talk about the subject. What was that like, you know, looking for experts, you know, not only on Hill, but on, you know, the history? Yeah, it kind of is uh, a situation where uh, the need uh, necessitates uh, the, the what you're going after. And um, uh, each step of the way, it was a situation where it's like, well, we have this story, but we want someone to weigh in on that story and want to give it a, a human face to it. And so, um, you know, e each individual came from different um, realms of history and, and, and storytelling. And um, so uh, that was kind of the path we, we went down is like, who can we get, who can we find to uh, tell this story? And then we kind of, create a list and figure it out, you know, where we can get to and who is available. So that is awesome. The other thing that I wanted to ask, um, how long did it take you to basically put together everything? I mean, there's a ton of photographs that are, that are in the, in the film and, and all the research, you know, I mean, what was the most challenging, you know, to be able to put together the whole entire thing? I think, just I'll just say like it's it's that this story could have been you know 20 hours it, and 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 maybe at one point our cut of this piece probably was close to six or seven or eight you know it was it was many more and and at some point you have to figure out what what each little section is doing and if you know, if you're, you know, you could tell told a, a different town building, you know, uh, a story for every town along the railroad. What made this one different than this one? You know, and and it was just a series of kind of starting, you know, a story starting as one thing, but really kind of whittling it down to the essence of what of what was special about this one. You know. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just going to add that uh, uh, every, what's interesting about this is that 
everything that Hill is involved with in over his career um, requires just an immense amount of research. It's like, I didn't know anything about short selling. I didn't know anything about the Chinese Exclusion Act or Eugene Debs or the Interstate Commerce Commission. And it's like the amount of research that you have to do in order to scale it down to one sentence that helps summarize it is enormous because you don't want to have everything sit on a foundation in which you know you're inaccurate about what you're saying and so um so uh, you know it, it's everything from dry land farming to uh how the new york stock exchange works so what's the cornering of a market and and whatnot so um so the heart so i mean to, to kyle's point it's like gathering all the information and lining it all up is 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 the easier part the the, the more difficult part is distilling it into what's important, what's relevant, what stays you online and what doesn't deviate too far. And um, so it's, it's all those things. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you, you, you whittle down and whittle down until it's a, a as fine tuned as right. you'd like. Yeah. And it wasn't really until yeah. probably a couple, a couple years ago that it, it went from, a shift thinking about it as okay this is a four or five or six hour movie that we have to scale down to two hours to hey what if we split it up into you know episodes what does that do and where do we start and where do we finish you know and what if we you know started an episode with this you know and and that's when you kind of start playing around of moving sections i mean we were we we changed you know, the opening of a, of episode four, maybe two, two months before we finished. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> and that was just because it was like, okay, how do, you know, how do we start this? Uh, we weren't in love with how we started the episode four. And, uh, and so you're just constantly like watching it, refining it. What, what bores you, you know, what, what gets you really excited? How do we play that up? You know, and sometimes, uh, you know, it, there could be a section that we think wasn't working, but it was in it, the problem wasn't that section. It was what came before it, you know? So it's just, uh, it's just kind of constantly refining and, and, and. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing too, with this long of a project you just can't sit down and review it it's a four hour five hour <laughs> process and so every time you sit down you're like okay all right let's you know because that's you know you 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 want to sort of put yourself in that viewer's situation where they're watching an episode or two at a time and how does the whole arc of it all you know flow and you just i mean i i, I don't know how you can produce like an 18 hour baseball and how many times did Ken Burns watch that? I don't know, you know, but, but uh, uh, I imagine. And, and, and the other difficult thing is the two of us are both editing in it and directing it. And so we're in the weeds. So we're trying to go micro and macro at the same time. So we're in the weeds going like, Oh, I love this little tiny piece of detail, but we're also like going, yeah, but who really cares? You know? Uh, so it, it, it's, it, we were battling ourselves. We were battling each other. And, uh, uh, but it was always sort of clear that the, uh, the, the, the piece itself was the important part of course, and what, what served it best. What do you hope that people get out of the film, you know, after watching it? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really kind of, well, what I've learned in the process over these 20 years of trying to raise money and, uh, try to explain who Hill was, is that very few people today know who he is. And if you do know who he is, you've probably heard a couple of incorrect things, um, or you have no idea to, uh, the extent of his accomplishments or how much he differentiated himself from other railroad barons of his day. So uh, an, an end goal for me would be uh, to get it out there and, and, and put Hill back into the pages of history because um, he's a gentleman that had, you know, relationships with seven different presidents and, and prime ministers and kings and uh, the, the major titans of his day, the Morgans, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, um, all these people he, you know, either partnered with or went toe to toe with. 
And uh, yet these people remain in the public mind uh, and Hill is nowhere to be found. Um, so uh, that's, that's a major goal for me is, uh, uh, and, and it's not just about wanting our film to get out there and be widely seen. It's about knowing who this fellow was, spending the last 20 years with them and feeling the injustice of what history has done to leave him sort of by the wayside um, and to and, and to not be able to understand why he isn't uh, more sought after as a, as a uh, uh, phenomenally interesting American uh, historical figure. Uh, I mean, it, it, the whole time we were producing this, we thought for sure we were going to get scooped and someone was going to jump into it and finish it quicker than, than us. But uh, so there's kind of a double-edged sword in no one knew about him. Yay. We're the first one to be able to tell the story, but also no one knew about him really difficult to raise money and where uh, raise awareness. I mean, I was watching the film and I couldn't get over how many big names in history, you know, like you said, and you know, like, the first time of me learning about Hill is from seeing a, a Facebook post post about, about your film that was going to be coming out. And I was like, boy, I'm so interested in the empire builder. I someday I want to ride the actual, you know, Amtrak line to be able to see it. Um, and then it, it just by watching the film, I, I learned more about, you know, how the line came about. And comparison, and then just learning about the other lines, how they were kind of like quickly put together. Hill really spent some time, you know, getting quality track. And then, of course, putting more money into the railroad once it was built to improve upon it. I mean, just the amount of uh, things just learned in the film. I mean, it made me appreciate the line even, you know, even more and wanting to to ride yeah. it. Um, yeah, one of the uh, the... the, the the funniest things was he has this life, like you said, where he has these interactions with everyone, Ulysses S. Grant to Teddy Roosevelt to uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Morgan. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Eugene Debs, you know, uh, wasn't even on my radar until uh, I learned about Hill. But the and, and then, you know, then we came across a story about um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And it's just mm -hmm. like their last train robbery happened to be a great Northern uh, flyer. And it was just like, well, and, and, it, and it's these characters, like, I mean, that, that are kind of mythical in our minds, like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid or Buffalo Bill or something like that. And that we wove into the story because it's like, these are real people and they're, and, and then to end the story in which the two doctors that perform surgery on him, are the Mayo brothers who start the Mayo Clinic, which is like everybody knows the Mayo Clinic, but they had no clue that they were actually two brothers. And here he was at the very end of his life and history is touching him, uh, you know, at the very end of his life again. So, I mean, he, he, you know, I've had people talk about him as a Forrest Gump type character where he just keeps appearing at these different moments in history. And um, that's what it seems like. Yeah, no, it, it's it's it's. It, 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 it's when people hear that it's a four hour train documentary or a four hour, you know, even a biography, it's just like, no, wait, it's just like, we had to squeeze it into four hours <laughs> and you'll, you'll, there's not a, a, a dull moment in terms of like the amount of information and things that will, you know, wow you in terms of the information that we came across. Cause it's just, I, I mean, and, and to make it even better, he was just a person that I developed a huge admiration for, which is, which is strange because I started with the idea that this would be a dramatic story about unscrupulous activities and backroom deals and things like that. And he just was a really decent fellow and he operated with a lot of integrity. I mean, certainly there were things that happened in his time that were in context of the era, but by and large, he had the ability to, do a lot of corruption um and he did not you know he had every uh, ability to uh town site uh speculate and whatnot um and uh he chose to do things that would build up a community and whatnot uh question for both of you uh something that 
didn't end up in the film that you wish that was in the film? Was there a, something that was something that you were kind of bouncing back and forth, whether mm, or not to throw in there? One. Oh, that's a good one, huh? Let's put Kyle on the spot. <laughs> well, I was usually on the opposite end. I was, <laughs> so the question is better. More, I was, less. <laughs> <laughs> um, God. But it's a good dynamic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there were, there were, there were other battles that Hill faced. Like there was a whole battle of uh, a railroad in the Kootenai region um, that he battled with a fellow Van Horn, who was the uh, president of the Canadian Pacific. And there was just that, that there was a whole story of the battles that he did with him. And we kind of already hit those notes with his battles against um, the Union Pacific's E.H. Uh, e. Harriman. And so it, it's that kind of thing where it's like, you know, he was involved in the building of Whitefish and Kalispell and Haver and all these other towns that we couldn't even mention, but we tried to do representative stories. Um, uh, there was, there was a, there was a profit sharing element that, uh, Hill brought into, uh, the corporation that was like unheard of at the time. And, um, but it just wasn't very sexy. And, uh, I couldn't necessarily say he was the first one to have ever done it, but it certainly was a rare thing at the time. So different, different little bits of the, I mean, the major stories we got. Um, so yeah. So my question is, so this is uh, certainly uh, the first, not the first railroad film that you've done. Uh, you did mention another one. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was a, a, a documentary short that I did back in 1996. So um, it, it, it was shot in, <laughs> in uh, beta and uh, that whole thing. And, and, and it's the story of the uh, Seattle-Tacoma Interurban. And it was a sort of a brand new uh, electric system that uh, connected the, the twin cities of the Puget Sound and, and brought huge development to the Northwest um, at a time when, you know, traveling that distance probably take a half a day as opposed to a couple hours. So, um, it, it, you know, in its own way, it was transformative uh, uh, as an inner city sort of thing. All right. So... I know that my editing level is nowhere probably near you guys. What's your, I'm going to get a little geeky. What is your uh, software of choice for editing? We use uh, Adobe Premiere and uh, yeah, uh, workflow wise, it's, it, it, we kind of had to solve that challenge because we're both working remotely. Um, and so we kind of have uh, mirrored hard drives and we kind of keep, fluctuating files on Dropbox and and it allow and it allows uh, me to open our computers are kind of uh, replicated it allows me to open Steven's projects even to open mine and uh, we do we've worked through zoom and uh, it's <laughs> and uh, we've worked obviously together a lot as well but uh, yeah Adobe premieres are our, our go-to. I was afraid because of the two of you being editors, I was thinking one's going to be Final Cut and one's going to be Premiere. And how's that going to all go? <laughs> well, interesting you bring that up is that uh, we both switched out of Final Cut, but I retained the shortcut keys and Kyle went to uh, Premiere shortcut keys. So every time he would come over to my place and edit, he'd have to like either redo the uh, keyboard <laughs> it's small thing but it was like i was the old dog can't teach the new trick and kyle was like i'm gonna do it the way yeah it's because the documentary started uh it, we actually when we edited it originally you know in the mid uh, 2000s uh it was in final cut pro and then when we re-picked it back up uh we had to convert everything over to Premiere. Uh, <laughs> i mean it, it's it's interesting how much has changed in our world um, in terms of this documentary, um, uh, 
the ability to download a photo at a moment's notice or search for an image is monumentally easier than it was when I produced the first documentary or just Kyle and I sending each other uh, uh, edits and stuff like that or um, uh, yeah, you know, just the hard drive space or what have you. And, and, and then there's the whole, I mean, when we were first starting this, it was like PBS or nothing. And, and now it's like, well, there's streaming possibilities. There's, uh, you know, all, all that sort of element too. So um, it really, uh, the, the, the market changed and the media changed and the technology changed to make this um, not an easy project, but <laughs> um, uh, one that um, uh, we, had a, we had a good flow of, of, use, of, of the best use of technology. In fact, at the very end of this process, we discovered uh, an AI technology that allowed us to take photos that were not very crisp and sharp or even footage that wasn't very crisp or sharp and elevate it. Because some of the sh stuff we shot 10, 12 years ago. And so what we were shooting then and what we were shooting now, entirely different formats. So um, yeah, we have been, uh, keeping our ear on the pulse of technology and uh, used it every way we could to uh, move the, the thing forward. Now a question for both of you. Do you now look at the railroads a little bit differently when you, when you travel past the, uh, the, you know, the railroad crossing, you're wondering what is the story of this line, you know? Um, and also ha do you have you, or do you have any plans to ride the empire builder? Well, Kyle should answer that question yeah. with regards to his family. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I come from a, a long line, a, kind of a Scandinavian family, and uh, my family moved to North Dakota in the early 1900s, uh, in large part because of the Great Northern Railway. And uh, the railway, as we kind of tell in the, uh, in the documentary, was recruiting, you know, Scandinavian immigrants to come live along the line. And... Um, and so it's fun to kind of go back and look at your own family history because, I, you know, I, I knew roughly about it. Oh, we were in North Dakota, but then going through and going, oh, no, we were there in 1909. This we're on the great, the you know, great northern line, like reliving your family's history. And it's been fun just for me and my family to kind of go through all that. So that it, it, uh, that's been a really fun part about the project for me. And how about you, Stephen? Well, I have to say that uh, driving by uh, the rail yards in South Seattle or uh, seeing King Street Station, which is the uh, uh, Northern Pacific, uh, Great Northern uh, Depot, um, seeing those things often uh, just reminds me how much it was part of the development of all these areas. And I think the railroad is one of those silent networks. Um, and I'm probably offending a lot of people by saying that um, because it's uh, such an important part of their lives, but it's like so much was riding on those rails that we don't even notice it. We don't even see it. And mostly it's just a, uh, 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 an impediment to, you know, crossing railroad tracks when, when the, the guardrail comes down. And that's mostly how we think of it. But it's just like the amount of freight that continues to uh, be transported by the rails is is phenomenal. And so it's just so interesting that the networks that were set up back in the day um, still remain as vital as they are today. And I think one of the most interesting things is when I look back at the Seattle Tacoma interurban railway that I did the documentary on, when you look at where they place the light rail today, it mirrors exactly that path. And it's just like, well, if they just had kept it, <laughs> it it's one of those things that is just like, when you chart that sort of uh, shortest distance between A and B, you're not going to argue with it later on. It's going to be a major corridor, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I'm just with being in this hobby, seeing the amount of lines that have abandoned over the years. And then uh, with this current generation, a lot of uh, people trying to move away from, you know, doing the commuter type of thing where you're driving alone in the car and using like a commuter rail or, or, 
or a local city rail line, um, a lot of people are looking for that. Unfortunately, a lot of the United States has gone away over periods of time. You know, when they had trolley cars that would take you across town and be able to stop here and there. I mean, it's just so amazing. But hopefully some of that stuff will come back. I know with certain states, a lot of uh, I know the governor of Massachusetts has been embracing, you know, making sure these lines don't go abandoned and try to bring some sort of commuter rail to it to kind of connect the whole entire state. So hopefully a lot more places will embrace the rail because mm -hmm. that's certainly a wonderful way to travel. So this wonderful film, tell us where we can buy it and how you can view it. Uh, currently uh, it's on our website at greatnorthernfilmworks.com. And it's also on Vimeo. You might have to hunt and peck a little, but um, you can get the link. Website, yeah, you yeah. can get the link from our website uh, to either stream it or rent it, or yeah. you buy a DVD for those who. And we're in the we're in the process right now of reaching out to uh, retail outlets like museums and hobby stores and and uh, train uh, railroad museums and things like that. In addition to kind of just exploring, uh, still exploring streaming options as well. So. So is there any projects in the works in the future for either one of you? <laughs> uh, this, this one took quite a lot out of us <laughs> and we're just trying to, uh, we're, um, it, it's, it's always the metaphor of, you know, you, you give birth to this thing and you want it to get up and running. And, um, and I think we're going to hold its hand a little bit um, uh, before we start thinking about our next kid. Yeah. Well, I've got to say, you know, it's an awesome documentary. I recommend people to to certainly purchase it uh, on DVD or stream it, you know, whatever way you prefer. I mean, it's certainly a great watch. You know, I started watching the episodes and I'm like, I'm like, well, they told a whole bunch of stuff in the last in the first two episodes. What's left? And then you go into episode three, and it's like, whoa, you know, like there's even more. And then in episode four, there's more. I mean, James Hill basically, he never. It seems like he wasn't ever sitting still, and he yeah. was always working. I yeah. my favorite, uh, actually. This might be uh, one of back to your question about uh, what what stories did we remit, omit? Um, but like, there's letters when he's writing to his wife, and like he might be 28. He's not even in the railroad yet, and he's like, you know, I look forward to a time where you know I can chill out and be with the kids, and like you know I'll make enough money. Like the refrain that he's constantly writing and telling his <laughs> wife is. I can't wait until I finish until I'm done with this. And the point is he, he never stopped. He never did. He, <laughs> he never stopped. looking for his next thing. He, he seems like he moved on to the next project. And then oh, next I mean, I, I, not to belabor this, but the, the thing about him was that he was so good at absorbing information. And, and we, we really felt like he had a photographic mind. Can't say for sure. But we had other people say that based on their sort of reasoning and whatnot. And a lot of people can absorb a lot of information. There's some very, very smart people in this world. But here's an individual that cannot just only absorb it, but figure out how to utilize that information and figure out, like, not just where to aim, but where you are pointing to that the next trend is going to hit sort of thing. And that's what he was constantly doing, just to a degree that it was almost prophetic in understanding just the trends, getting out of wood and getting into coal, getting out of coal and getting into, you know, iron and stuff. I mean, it just was a constant series of evaluating information and taking advantage of it, you know? So yeah, just phenomenally interesting character. That's for sure. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to be able to sit down with us uh, this evening and uh, if you've got any upcoming projects, especially if they're involving the railroads, come see me. I'll be happy to, to talk about it on the show again. I really appreciate you both uh, taking the time to uh, talk to us this evening. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan.